as a reminder all participant lines will be in listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes should you need assistance during the conference call please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone please note that this conference is being recorded i now hand the conference over to mr anup bakshi md and ceo of icic prudential life insurance thank you and over to you sir hi good afternoon everyone and welcome to the results call of icic prudential life insurance company for the present day june 30th 2023 Let me begin by highlighting the recent changes in our key per managerial personnel on behalf of the entire team at ICICI Prudential Life Insurance. I would like to express our heartfelt appreciation to Mr. Kanan for his exceptional leadership in scaling up the organization prudently and sustainably. I would also like to express our gratitude to Mr. Satyan Jambunathan, who served as our company CFO for his invaluable contribution to the growth and success of ICICI Pro Life. Satyan he was a founding member has decided to pursue early retirement after a remarkable career spanning two decades with us i'm pleased to announce that Viren Salyan has been appointed as a CFO effective May 18 2023 Viren has been associated with the company for 20 years and has held various positions across functions within the company would also like this opportunity to extend our best wishes to him in his new role Viren is with me on this call <laughs> I also have on the call several other senior colleagues, Amit Palta, who heads distribution, brand marketing, and products; uh, Jeet, who heads uh, human resources, customer service, and operations; and Deepak, who handles audit, legal, risk, and compliance; Manish, our CIO; Sobhik, our appointed actuary; and Dheeraj, our chief investor relations officer. Let me take you through some of the key developments during the quarter before moving on to our performance. Firstly. On the regulatory front, IID has extended the use and file mechanism towards launching new products that include group unit link life and health insurance products, as well as combi products where the life insurer takes the lead. Additionally, the approval process for new funds have also been simplified. These measures are aimed at providing insurers with greater flexibility to swiftly react to market dynamics and meet the evolving needs of the customers, thereby supporting IID's vision of insurance for all. Secondly. Aligned with our customer-centric philosophy, we further strengthen our product portfolio in Q1 2024 by launching new products and funds that complement our offerings. iShield, this was launched in 2023 in partnership with ICICI Lombard, offers a comprehensive protection proposition that combines the benefits of life and health insurance under one umbrella. In addition, we launched ICICI Pro Protect and Gain, a protection-oriented unit life insurance product that addresses both the protection. and savings need of the customers further strengthen our savings port portfolio with the addition of two new optional attachments icici pro non linked accidental health and disability rider and icici pro linked accident death and disability rider both are optional these attachments provide uh, additional protection against accidental death and disability and can be currently be added to many of our products We have also expanded our products of funds by adding constant maturity fund, a debt fund offered with our unit linked insurance plans. Against the backdrop of rising interest rates, this fund is suitable for customers looking for wealth preservation and tax efficient returns. Thirdly, I am happy to inform you that during the quarter, our company was awarded with the ASOCAM Award for Organizational Excellence in the data in the field of data science and analytics. Additionally, at Customer Fest Awards for 2023. Our team is honored with a slew of awards, namely Best Data Analytics Team, Best Use of Data and Insights in a Transformation Project, Best Use of Mobile to Enhance Customer Experience, and Best Data Enablement Campaign in a Loyalty Program. Our corporate communication team was featured in the top 30 corporate communication teams for 2023 at India Inc. instituted by Reputation Today. I will now move on to discussing our company strategy and performance. We have uploaded the presentation on the stock exchanges and our website. You can refer the same as we go through our performance. In FY 2023, we successfully accomplished our stated objective of doubling the 2019 GNB. This achievement was made possible through the meticulous execution of our four P strategy, that is, protection growth, premium growth, persistency improvement, and productivity enhancement. 
these four P strategic elements will continue to play a crucial role in growth of our absolute VNB while keeping customer centricity at the core of everything we do, along with integrating ESG with business management. Our very purpose of existence is to provide financial security to our customers and their families. We believe we are the trustees of the life savings entrusted to us by our customers in order to achieve their protection, health, retirement, and long-term savings goal. Our philosophy is to understand the later needs of our customers and curating products that address the unique needs of diverse customer segments. We leverage digital and analytics capabilities to distribute our products through the most appropriate channels. Our goal is to provide a superior experience throughout the customer life cycle while following a diligent risk management framework. To ensure that we remain true to our philosophy and improve our performance across all the four key strategic elements, we have a 4D framework which drives our 4P strategy. The elements of the 4D frameworks are data analytics, diversified propositions, digitalization, and depth in partnerships, with focus on quality business in a risk calibrated manner. This framework will ensure products are aligned with the customer needs, are designed to meet those most needs most effectively, are developed with the highest quality standards, and are developed through the most appropriate channels. Also, this framework will help us provide simplified and hassle-free processes to our customers across the product life cycle. The framework has been detailed in slide five of the presentation. The first element of the 4D framework is data analytics. Over a period, we have built a significant analytics capabilities that help us to provide better value to our customers and partners. We have leveraged data and information to help us improve our various processes, such as distribution operations, etc., and to identify new growth opportunities. We understand that customers expect seamless and personalized experience, and data analytics plays a crucial role in making this a reality. We have therefore invested in machine learning and artificial intelligence to provide tailor-made insurance solutions to our customers. Our analytical capabilities help us to identify customers through machine learning-based segmentation across demographics and customer behavior, create geographic clusters, and position appropriate products in those geographic clusters. With data sciences and analytics, we aim to reduce barriers and points of friction in the entire process that prevent customers from buying life insurance. These capabilities are also extended to our partners to help identify opportunities to cross-sell our products. Further, machine learning models are enabling us to improve persistency, streamline claims, and bolster our risk management practices. Through AI, we analyze customer sentiments to improve the overall customer satisfaction. The details of our extensive deployment of analytics capabilities are set out in slides 36 to 38. Further, our analytics team's awards during the quarter are a testimony to our constant efforts in deploying extensive data analytics. The second element of the 4D framework is diversified propositions. Over the years, our customer product strategy has been focused on expanding the product suite and continuously providing innovative propositions to our customers. This approach ensures that our products are suitable and accessible to a wider range of customers spread across customer segments, age, affluence, and other demographic aspects, enabling us to serve a large market effectively. Further, the continuously can recalibrate its product offerings to align with the evolving need of customers. This proactive approach has allowed us to effectively navigate the changing landscape and ensure that our product remains relevant and impactful. Building on this approach in Q1 2024, we have successfully launched new products and fund offerings. Moving on to the third element, that is digitalization. Together with our customer first philosophy, as a company, we realized very early that digitalization would be a differentiator in times to come. We use technology to help us make life insurance accessible and an empowering experience for customers. As a part of that belief, we were one of the first life insurance companies to begin our digital transformation journey way back in 2012. Across the customer life cycle, starting from policy purchase to claim settlement slash maturity, digitalization has underpinned our journey. Our endeavor is to create simplified and hassle-free processes for our customers. We have fully digitalized our pre-sales, onboarding, issuance, and servicing processes. Through digitalization, we have empowered our customers or servicing aspects, including self-service, renewals, and quick claim assistance. More than 99% of all our policies issues are logged digitally. 
Further, our digital platform has been extended to employees and partners too. We have been leveraging digital tools to strengthen our sales digital capabilities. We empower our partners with customer-centric digital support across their processes with a very clear focus of ease of doing business and creating a better customer experience. Few examples of the digital support, including our own technological capabilities to identify customer opportunities within partner database, utilizing our demand generation tools to enhance partner productivity, and leveraging digital onboarding to reduce issuance time. As we look forward, we will continue to reimagine all our processes to leverage the ever-changing digital ecosystem and continue to provide a better experience to all our stakeholders. Moving on to the fourth element, that is depth in partnerships. Distribution in life insurance business is a critical link that bridges the gap between the products and the customers. We have made significant strides in expanding our distribution reach by onboarding additional partners and investing in our own proprietary channels. The natural advantage that it gives us is access to a heterogeneous set of customer bases that spans across geographies, demographics, age, and affluence. We believe that to have a sustained competitive advantage, we need to equip our partners to grow their overall insurance business and we continue to focus on increasing the depth of our customers and distributors base. We extensively work with our partners to deep mind the customer opportunities while remaining focused on the quality parameters. We empower our partners with a suite of digital tools to help them position life insurance more effectively and in a more holistic manner. We support them by integrating the ecosystem for easy onboarding of customers and post sales service and build capacity by training partner employees in products and processes. This entire 4D framework has been put in place by keeping in mind our core objective to deliver quality business in a risk calibrated manner. Our risk management framework sets out the risks that we are prepared to accept given the expected risks, rewards, and consistency with strategic objectives and those risks for which we have no tolerance and want to avoid. We regularly monitor our experience in, in respect of insurance risk, that is mortality, morbidity, persistency, and expense, and take actions to ensure that our emerging experience is consistent with our expectations. We minimize our investment risk by following a prudent investment philosophy. Our investments are made with regard to nature and term of liabilities. We have a low exposure to interest rate guaranteed products and we hedge the risk for these products. We continue to diversify our product and distribution mix to avoid any excessive concentration risk in the business. To summarize, the diligent and prudent risk management framework we operate on is reflected in our strong and resilient balance sheet. Moving on to quickly the key quarterly performance highlights for Q1 2024 presented in slide 6. Our VMB for Q1 2024 stood at 4.18 billion with a margin of 30%. Our total APE stood at 14.61 billion for Q1 2024. We have witnessed a very strong growth momentum in our retail APE from non ICICI bank channels in the month of May and June. Amit will talk in detail later during the call. Our protection AP stood at 3.44 billion in Q1 2024 on account of strong retail protection growth of 61.8% year on year. Our consistency improved significantly across all cohorts. Our 13 month persistency stood at 86.4 and 49 month persistency stood at 64.7. Our cost to TWRP ratio for savings lines of business stood at 18.8% in Q1 2024. I will now hand it over to Amit to talk to you through our results on four key strategic elements, after which Dhiren will take you through the financial highlights. Thank you and over to you, Amit. Thank you, Amit. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I will now talk about performance update for quarter one, FY24, through the elements of the four key strategy. Starting with the premium growth element from slide seven to 12, we have used a two-pronged strategy to drive premium growth. First, investing in building existing channels and widening the distribution to maintain a diversified distribution mix. And second, continuing to strengthen our product portfolio to address changing consumer preference in a dynamic economic environment. As you can see on slide eight, on the distribution front, we have continued to invest across channels. Our strategy in the agency channel is to leverage on strong relationship of agents with customers while we provide institutional support to agents in terms of data analytics and processes. 
We continue to build capacity and have added more than 7,400 agents during quarter one spread across geographies. Within the bank and non-bank channel, we continue to add new partnerships and increase share of shop in the existing partnerships. We now have a total of 39 bank partnerships and more than 950 non-bank partnerships with addition of 49 non-bank partners during quarter one. As you can see on slide nine for overall quarter, our APE excluding ICICI Bank grew by 3.7% YOI. Agency for the quarter grew by 4.4%. However, we have witnessed a strong growth of 20% in May and 23% in June 2023. Direct business grew by 28.5% year on year. Partnership distribution grew by 7.7% year on year. And our excluding ICICI Bank retail business witnessed strong growth momentum of 20% in May and 21% in June 2023. As you can see from slide 10, we have a comprehensive suite of products. Also, as mentioned by Anil, we continue to strengthen our product portfolio to address changing consumer preference in a dynamic economic environment. As you can see from slide 11, our APE for quarter one stood at 14.61 billion. Our APE from savings business stood at 11.17 billion per quarter. And we continue to maintain a very diversified product mix with quarter one AP contribution from link savings business at 38.8%, non-link savings at 27.7%, protection at 23.5%, annuity at 6.2%, and the balance 3.8% coming from group saving products. As you can see from slide 12, we are well diversified in terms of distribution mix and product mix, which allows us to manage the impact of the external environment and respond swiftly to shifting consumer preference. Another important focus area for us is to serve the life protection needs of the customer. On this aspect, let me talk about the second P, which is protection growth on slide 14. With an AP of 3.44 billion, the overall protection segment saw year-on-year -year growth of 4.2%, leading to a business mix of 23.5% in the quarter. The retail protection business registered a strong year-on-year -year growth of 61.8% to 1.1 billion. Our total new business sum assured stood at 2.4 trillion for quarter and a growth of 8.8% year-on-year. Our total sum assured stood at 30.41 trillion as on June 30th, 2023. Coming to our third P, which is persistency improvement, it is presented on slide 16. We continue to have a strong focus on improving the quality of business and customer retention, which is reflected in the significant improvement in persistency ratios across all cohorts. We would like to highlight here that our 13-month persistency ratio improved to 86.4, and our 49-month persistency ratio improved to 64.7%. Now moving on to fourth P, which is productivity enhancement, which is presented on slide 18. Our total expenses grew by 21.9% year on year, the expenses are higher as compared to the, the same period last year on account of continued investment in capacity creation to support future growth. Our overall cost to total weighted received premium stood at 27.7% and cost to PWRP ratio for the savings business at 18.8% for the quarter. Even with the cost increase, our cost to average asset under management has been stable at 2.3%. Through the 4P strategy of premium growth, protection business, uh, persistency improvement, and productivity enhancement, our objective remains the same to increase the absolute value of new business. I will now hand it over to Dhiren to talk you through the outcome of 4P strategy and financial update for quarter one 2024. Thank you, Amit. Good afternoon. I will now take you through some of the financial metrics. We continue to maintain a strong and resilient balance sheet as presented in slide 19. We have evaluated insurance risks and mortality experience, and they are within our expectations, and we will continue to monitor them closely. On credit risk, only 0.2% of our fixed income portfolio is invested in bonds stated below AA, and we continue to maintain a track record of not having a single NPA since our inception. Of our total liabilities, 74.7% .7 of liabilities largely pass on market performance to customers. We continue to closely monitor our liquidity and AM position, and we have no issues to report. As a result of our 4P strategy, the VNB for quarter one was 4.38 billion. Given our APE of 14.61 billion rupees, the resultant VNB margin was 30% for quarter one. 
Coming to the financial update as presented in slide 21, our profit of the tax grew by 32.7% year on year from 1.56 billion rupees in quarter one last year to rupees 2.07 billion this quarter. Our assets under management stood at 2.6 trillion and our solvency ratio continued to be strong at over 203% at June 30th. To summarize, we will continue to make progress against the 4P framework of premium growth, protection business growth, process improvement, and productivity enhancement. We expect that our performance in these aspects will translate into our objective to grow absolute BNB. Before concluding the call, I would also like to share that during the quarter, we released our FY23 annual report, which was themed delivery on promises and delivering sustainable growth. Along with that, we also released a standalone ESG report, which articulates our approach and outcomes of our efforts towards sustainability. The integrated reporting structure prescribed by the International Integrated Reporting Council has been followed for developing the annual report. Thank you, and we're now happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We have our first question from the line of Suresh Ganapati from Macquarie Group. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, my first question is to Anoop. Um, Anoop, you, it's been maybe a couple of months for you um, as a CEO. Um, you know what, in your assessment, I know it is still early days, what do you think are the areas of improvement or what are the gaps that, uh, that you have identified? Um, that's my first question and of course related to that, how well do you plan to leverage the ICICI bank distribution channel? Is there a change in mindset with respect to distribution of products by them? How do you plan to leverage that network? That's the first question. And the second question, maybe Darian can take it. What explains the sharp rise in expense ratios and the fall in margins uh, this quarter, despite a sharp pickup in protection APE? Uh, overall APE was down. Uh, but still OPEX is high, so just the clarity on these two questions. Thank you so much. No, no, thank you, Sudesh. So I'll just answer your two questions, area of improvement and ICC bank. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I must say that the team here is very good. Kanan has left a very good balance sheet, very sound and prudent balance sheet. So there is really nothing really to worry on those counts at all. Uh, the other thing of transformation is largely complete, and the transformation by way of of diversification of products and diversification of channels is also largely complete. There is no area of improvement. One, the area of focus certainly will be growth because as you know, uh, our margins, uh, you know, were last year was at uh, uh, 31, this year it is 30%. So uh, margin we are, you know, at the topish level in the first top decile or top quartile of the market. Mm -hmm. uh, the the real driver of VNB, uh, our plant will be towards to get it through growth rather than the margins. And so to activate many of our uh, channels are 18 months old and 24 months old. And so they are not really uh, fully mature in the sense that our share of shop in those uh, channels, we can improve. Uh, we can help them through data and analytics, understanding, co-understanding of their own client base making sure that we are able to train them on the most suitable products, ensuring that during the life stage uh, that we are able to help and support them so that you know both of us generate good business. Uh, and, and and that is really the area of focus, and not really area of improvement, but I'll say area of focus. And I must also say that the team here is uh, very, very good and fully aligned to this objective. As you know, we have been uh, uh, you know, focusing on getting the transformation bit right and uh, successfully I must say that in four years the VNB was doubled in absolute amount, uh, but the driver of that was margin more than EP growth. And so now with the bank, in a way, uh, the contribution of the bank coming to on the lower side, all other channels will now start to almost start to show up on growth. Now, as far as bank is concerned, I must say that bank has two distinct roles. One as a shareholder, one as a distributor. As a shareholder, they are a fantastic shareholder. 
they are extremely supportive, both ICICI Bank as well as Prudential. But in the context of distribution also, because Prudential is not a distributor, ICICI Bank also is a distributor for us. They are focused on uh, protection and annuity. And uh, that is something that, you know, uh, it is up to them as a distributor. Uh, what is their view on distribution? Our plans largely are now because it's a small proportion and contribution is lower for ICICI Bank. We can get our growth primarily from all other channels as well. If bank comes, it is bonus, but it is really up to the bank uh, to respond to that uh, question. Over to you, Vidyan. Yeah, hi, Suresh. So some of the larger contributions of the expense growth uh, are uh, manpower costs, uh, which of course uh, additional people that we have on the ground to be able to activate uh, some of our newer channels. And uh, some other elements around uh, distribution uh, costs, which are fundamentally around advertising and sales costs. Uh, but more so, I think when you look at the VNB, uh, you're aware the way we look at it is more from a full year's perspective of uh, where we expect cost to be. Uh, and so when you look at the VNB, you see that uh, largely it is uh, driven by the impressive product mix profile that has been shifting. Uh, what you can see anyway is from a traditional perspective, uh, you are anyway aware that uh, there is a uh, five lakh cases, there are anyway the taxation aspects that have come through in some first April. So within the traditional pool, we've seen a uh, drop away from the higher ticket size, mm -hmm. uh, non-linked uh, guaranteed portfolio uh, to some level that has gone across to the participating side, uh, which has picked up quite smartly. Uh, and to another level, we're seeing some signs of uh, moving towards the unit linked uh, side. So while you are right, at one level, we've got a growth in uh, retail protection. There are some counteracting elements that have come through uh, overall. Okay, that's clear. Thanks, Anu Tandirin. Thank you. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Supratim Datta from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Thanks for the opportunity. So I'll start off with, you know, your point on investing in the newer channels. So you have 39 bank partners. Uh, could you give us an understanding about what would be a share be in these banks um, uh, outside of I Bank? And... How do you plan to grow here? Because uh, 26 of these partners, 25, 26 of these partners have been there for more than two years. So how are you planning to grow this channel going forward? That's one. Next, on the agency side, that has been a strong growth driver for you. But from a productivity perspective, uh, your agent, uh, the new business premium per agent is still at the lower end compared to the industry. So how do you plan to grow that? What are steps that you are taking? You know, if you could share, give us some light on that. So yeah. for data yeah, yeah. question, but uh, you know, when I look at your RWRC and compare that with your individual AP, your RWRC uh, comes out to 10.6 billion, whereas your individual AP is 11.7. So if you could help me understand what's driving that difference between these two uh, lines, that would be the help them. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, will you just take those questions and then I'll yeah. come in. Yeah, so uh, I'll come in here. Uh, let me start with share of business with our new bank partners. Uh, see, the, if you were to look at new partnerships that we have uh, stitched over a period of last 18 to 24 months, uh, we saw the, a huge traction of business, which was driven uh, three tax uh, scarcity that we witnessed in uh, January, March, uh, specifically in February and March. And we saw that some part of the business pulled into last quarter of last year. And hence, there was general overall slowdown, uh, which was witnessed not just in uh, bank partners, but also in some non bank partnerships as well, uh, which spans across corporate agency and broker. But the good news is that while overall pie may have shrunk because of half of the quarter, uh, the remaining half of the quarter, actually, is that we have seen the growth coming back. So overall, PI has started growing in the second half of the quarter. And our share of business actually has incrementally grown across all our large partnerships. So where we were to where we are, uh, though, of course, the delta share could be different partner to partner. But uh, large number of our partnerships, we have seen our share growing, even though the overall PI was kind of static. So that is the status on all the bank partnerships, and not just bank partnerships, I'm extending this argument to even other multi-insurer CDR partnerships that we have. So that is one thing, one area uh, of uh, 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 area I would like to just articulate. Second point, you spoke about agency productivity. So 
so now uh, i would understand that probably the way you are calculating agency productivity is on the total number of agents total business done divided by total number of agents so if you recollect that for large for long period of time in the past we were actually not terminating advisors right so as you know the advisors over a period of time uh they ruled on to the insurance business the continuing insurance business and large number of advisors also kind of you know uh, you know stopped doing insurance and they after they exhausted the natural market so even after they had exhausted the natural market we tend to stay away from terminating those advisors and hence they are reflecting in the pool what is most important in agency distribution while calculating productivity is to see your manageability of these advisors and this manageability of advisors we used to look at 3000 or unit managers who used to manage these advisors now that manageability we have improved over a period of last 12 to 15 months by increasing our unit manager capacity from 3000 to almost 4000 which is almost like adding capacity of 33% so if you look at productivity of the units that we have seen significantly growing over a period of last 2 to 3 years in between there was a period during covid when we refrained from adding this capacity as you know but this is direct addition to our cost but however whatever investment that we have done in last 15 months or so we have started seeing the results already as we speak in quarter 1 you can clearly attribute some 4 to 5% of our top line in agency being contributed by the capacity that we have built over a period of last 12 to 15 months which means that at the early gestation period if we were to look at uh in a low vintage pool of our units uh to contribute 5 to 7% of our top line is quite significant and as we uh, go deep into the year we expect this capacity to deliver anywhere close to around 15 to 18% of our business as we have planned annually in the agency business so so for thing your third question was uh, the divergence between what is rwrp and ap uh, that can come through if uh, there are uh, let us say non annual modes that are being written uh, of course it will not show up in uh, rwrp it will show up in ap so yeah just non annual what i could not get that monthly mode monthly mode policy okay got it mr datta are you through with your question yes yeah. thank you thank you we have a next question from the line of avinash singh from mk global please go ahead yeah hi uh, good evening a couple of questions uh first one if i just uh, try to look uh, within protection uh as uh, uh, we can see on the group side i mean there has been sort of a decline and it would appear given the kind of a retail credit uh, growth it is largely into the gti where you would have seen decline uh can you just help us sort of because you are you, you have been a pretty is kind of a dominant player in this market so how has been the market and what has been the reason behind sort of a your uh, going cautious or withdrawing from some parts of the gti market so that's number one a uh, second question a bit uh, continuing from uh, uh, what mr bakshi said on uh, sort of a, you know uh, uh, things in being in place and uh, growth being the sort of a uh, uh, top on agenda the uh, sort of a, if you can just help i mean uh, i mean if i go, look back for the four years you had a clear vnb uh, absolute vnb growth plan if if you were to look ahead uh, with a uh, focus on growth what sort of a, a relative or absolute growth of kind of a range or aspiration you will have over the medium term and uh, related to that i mean your direct has been growing a uh, very sort of a strongly in this quarter is the sort of a, that is driven by retail protection growth or is the other way so i mean how sustainable is this uh, direct channel growth thank you so i'm going to be take some of these questions uh, within the group protection there are two parts of it there is uh, credit life and there is group term which is employer employee now the credit life continues to grow but if you recall our earlier conversations on group term which is the employer employee space uh, if you recall that we actually had higher prices which was an offshoot of covid pricing that was still remnant in last year's uh, uh, portion of last year's business as you are renewing business this year all of those covid loadings have gone away so to that extent there is a challenge in staying in the same place while even though we're doing much better in terms of deal closures uh, the absolute premium therefore is a little challenge to that extent but as you go through the year we expect this to wash away that's at one level uh, in terms of what we have 
starting to speak in terms of uh, VNB from a medium term perspective, uh, clearly, as Anu pointed out earlier, uh, the profile shift in terms of the product has actually trans uh, happened over the last four years. And going forward, I don't think there's going to be large shift in the product profile, which means you're not seeking to grow VNB through margin. Uh, you seek to grow VNB primarily from APB growth. And to that extent, uh, some of the trends that you could see over this last quarter, specifically when you look at uh, the months of uh, May and June, you'd see one sequential growth, plus you see uh, strong year-on-year -year growth. In fact, in the month of June, we had a double-digit growth in APE uh, for that month. So clearly, we're seeing good movement and uh, strong movement in terms of APE. Uh, where this would end up, I think, uh, would be a function of two key uh, segments. One, of course, how does savings actually pan out over the rest of the year? There are, of course, these transient elements in terms of the taxation aspects that have possibly impacted. Uh, but as we had mentioned before, we kind of uh, expect to see that wash away as we look through the full year. Of course, the environment factors will continue uh, in terms of macro, uh, but we'll have to see how that pans out uh, through the year. Fundamentally, we don't think that this is going to be a drag. I think uh, more from a medium-term perspective, uh, there isn't, there's an expectation that saying business will continue to grow in terms of uh, nominal GDP. Where the kicker can be is obviously in terms of protection and more specifically in terms of retail protection. You've seen those green shoots come through. We've been speaking about this for the past few quarters. And now as you uh, see the strong growth of 62% uh, year on year for the quarter, I think it gives us a lot of comfort to say that the entire sales uh, distribution team has understood that this is the new way of doing business. And uh, that has started to see through not just across sales, but in terms of uh, the back-end operations teams as well. So I think we are a lot, uh, we're in a far better position today than what we were even uh, 18 months back. And uh, uh, from that perspective, I think for a medium term, we will see how this uh, evolves. At best, uh, this could uh, be another, uh, and we, sorry, we've always held that uh, from a protection perspective, retail protection perspective, it's not just a few years uh, uh, in terms of the trajectory, we think it's a multi decadal opportunity, and we continue to hold on to that view. In uh, fact, uh, yeah. just to add, uh, uh, and then, uh, see, today, uh, businesses other than ICCI is now close to around 87% of our business. And this 87% of our business grew at 20% in May, grew at 20% in June. So that gives us comfort, Avinash, that uh, uh, even if ICCI stays where it is, I think 87% of the business will help us uh, be in line with the industry growth. And uh, rest margins will allow customer preferences to dictate how the margins will pan out. But overall, on EP growth aspirations, I think we are in a better position now with 87% of the portfolio already exhibiting the most recent uh, growth trends of May and June. Coming to one more question you had on direct business. Uh, yes, uh, we do have uh, an ups, uh, upside on direct channel. As you know, direct channel uh, is uh, proprietary sales force uh, largely looking at upsell opportunities within the existing customer base of ours. Uh, we continue to use our deep analytics to identify spaces, uh, how we can leverage uh, in a dynamic environment where tax uh, benefits are going away. And we capitalized on our ability to reach out to our existing customers with alternate propositions the fastest. So you have the advantage of, of direct channel being fastest to get this proposition going to our customers. And that is something that we have seen as a conversion. This has also given us the cues to create enablement to our partnership intermediary driven businesses as well. I do believe that this is sustainable, not just an upsell, but we are looking at uh, going beyond upsell and, and explore some of the strategic segments that we can address through our proprietary sales force, which is part of direct. And also, as you know, the direct business also comprises uh, our ability to cross-sell through our uh, digital, uh, 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 our, our digital assets, which is our website and application, we continue to improve our customer experience at our website as well as applications. And of course, we'll explore opportunities around our partners to see how we can leverage their digital assets as well. So it looks quite sustainable in a nutshell, if I were to tell you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to ensure that the management is able to answer queries from all participants, please restrict your questions to two at a time. You may join back the queue for follow-up questions. We'll take our next question from the line of Prakash Kaparia from Anivet Portfolio Managers. Please go ahead. 
My questions have been answered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Madhukar Lada from Nuama Wealth Management. Please go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, we are not able to hear you clearly. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry about that. So, uh, I wanted to get a better sense of, uh, you know, why are other bank channels uh, in Q1, if we if if we look at that segment. uh they've been flattish in fact there's been a decline of about half a percent so uh, so what is uh, sort of hindering growth over there uh and maybe if you could uh, let us know or tell us about you know uh, what is our counter share in some of our major bank partners um, um and uh, whether growth will be given more by the channel growth itself or are we looking at increasing our share uh some color over there uh, will be helpful yeah so madhukar i answered this question previously as well let me brief just reiterate once again uh growth which looks flattish for the quarter actually returned to growth in the month of june we are close to around 6 to 7% of our growth uh, that is bank partnerships beyond icici and like i mentioned uh, multi insurer banks as well as cbr partners did see a huge scale up on traction built around tax scarcity in the month of march and hence we cannot rule out some part of the demand being pulled into march and hence we saw some impact of that in the first half of the quarter so the overall pie at these banks was was relatively constrained but however our share at these shops still continue to increase I can't give specific uh, numbers around partnerships, but all I can say is it was quite significant in terms of uh, overall growth in the in the share of our business, and we believe that with the growth returning in the second half of the quarter, even if the current share we we hold ourselves into good stead, and probably will gain having uh, picked our market share up in the second half. So that is what I would like to articulate. Here. understood just a follow up uh, on the icici bank channel i think uh, you know uh, mr bakchi clearly mentioned that uh, the decision of what they want to sell lies with them uh, having said that uh, what is your expectation in terms of uh, you know numbers from there do you think that uh, this channel which did about 1200 crores uh last year in business does it uh, uh has it plateaued uh or or will it decline further from from here uh how, what are you guys building in uh when you make your business plans no 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 this is a, so this is anup here uh, so today the proportion of icici bank is small so to that extent uh, i see it as a positive thing in the sense that 87% to 85 to 87% we have full control uh, of growing and 85 the balance 13 to 15% it is on icici bank as to what their stance is uh, but they have said that the two products that you know do two categories that they would be focused on would be protection and annuity uh, our plans essentially are not so much dependent on icici bank now so ours are independent plan uh, basis other channel and on the other channel we are very clearly seeing that uh, these are all 84 18 months 24 months older channels the share of shop there is increasing and wherever we have done partner workshops and we have put our cd strategy clearly there is a good acceptance of that we certainly want to be the partner of choice for all our partners and we would want to help them do more and more of these businesses in many places we have seen that the absolute penetration of customer that is customer divided policy divided by the customer base is all less than 1% half percent somewhere 1 and half 2% and uh, it is inconceivable that only half a percent or 1% would be wanting this kind of or would insurance product would be suitable to only 1% of the customer base and to that extent what we have to really work hard is to move the penetration up and also show value to the partner 
that by selling a insurance product which is a long term product in a good in a good way that is with high persistence is indeed increases the stickiness of the customer with the partners and long term stickiness of the partners which really helps them in their other products as well particularly in banking and uh, that is a value that we will with our full data analytics and 4d we would want to demonstrate to them and keep increasing our share number one of the existing business that they do but we will also help them create new drivers of business for their insurance businesses which is going to help us so that is going to be the approach in general uh, from our side so but uh, so i understand that you know it's up to icic bank as to how much business they want to grow but what do you think what is sort of your expectation of growth from icic bank that is so as a manufacturer as a manufacturer all manufacturer think that distributor should do good business so our expectation also is that if icic bank uh, does well uh, we will only be very happy okay Yes, to give you, uh, yes, to give you some quick sense, Madhukar. Uh, in the businesses that they have chosen to prioritize, ICICI Bank is already on a growth path. So, to that extent, in protection, uh, ICICI Bank is on a good double-digit growth. Right. Okay. All right. I'll come back in the queue. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Prithvish Uppal from AmSec. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. uh so just uh, firstly wanted to understand uh, you know the retail protection growth has been quite strong for us uh, for this quarter and even sequentially we we you know we've been uh, more or less at this similar kind of run rate so uh, what channels uh, has this been driven by is and second is uh, uh, have we seen an increase in policy count in retail protection as well or is it more driven by Uh, you know, some assured uh, being purchased, like a greater amount of some assured being purchased. So that would be my first question. Uh, second is, uh, if you could just hi- highlight, uh, you know, what what could possibly be the average ticket size in your non-par uh, segment during the quarter, uh, compared to probably say, uh, you know, last year and 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 possibly even, you know, how much uh, the policy count has grown. So these are my first two questions, and then I'll come back for a for a follow up. Yeah, Amit, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Vijay, you want to? Yeah. Uh, yes. Prithvish, uh, in terms of call count for uh, retail protection, of course, we've seen a uh, improvement. It's not just a uh, ticket size uh, 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 angle; it's also a policy count uh, aspect there. So yes, uh, the uptick actually has been on uh, more number of cases being sold. and uh, this is actually quite broad based it's not just one or two channels uh, of course at various points in time you might see some uh, shift across from one to another but uh, it's a broad based effort that has been going on across all channels through the years and we start to see that in this particular quarter as well uh, in terms of the ticket size that you mentioned for uh, non par i think we're seeing is broadly stable uh, and this is trending downwards uh because of course we don't have the uh, more than 5 lakh cases in the same quantum that we had last time but as you also aware the total uh, cases over 5 lakhs was not that large for us as a company uh, so to that extent we are not unduly worried and more importantly i think we're starting to see some migration away from uh, uh, non link more than 5 lakh towards the unit link pool which means we're not losing the customer we're able to offer them something else uh, uh, as they come and uh, approach us also on the just to add on the income uh, on the, on the retail protection side essentially four there are four things that you require to do one is on the kyc side second one is income estimation that is in general for life insurance policy third is health and fourth more and more and more if you want to do pre approved some assured kind of products for retail protection you would then want to only take it essentially as a question answer where customers give information and so the fourth element becomes a critical thing how do you establish authenticity of the information because if later on during the claim if the information given is doesn't turn out to be fully right then there could be an issue on the claim which is something that you know no no insurance company would want to do because we are there to give claims uh, for 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 good customers and now if we see the over the last 3 4 5 years many of the things uh, either are fully digitizable uh, device is fully digitizable better and better income estimation models are coming in 
uh, better and better health models are coming in and without with uh, better path labs etc so that ecosystem is also developing and if you go towards uh, pre approved some assured uh, there also on the authenticity of data there are other markers that you can bring in to get more authenticity of data so actually more and more and more we see that the congestion levels on the protection if it is brought down we are also seeing a shift in the society wherein the demand for protection is coming albeit for a certain segments of customers so when there is a demand if you are able to then streamline the processes of meeting the demand through decongested processes without without trading of risk and prudence i think this is a business of growth and this is a business that we will certainly be focused we are focused on this business we will be focused on this business and i think this is a good business to be in it is margin attractive it is it is good for customers it increases policy count and it indeed is what insurance companies life insurance companies particularly uh, we all strive to do more and more and more of that uh okay so thanks that well understood um coming to um, you know i request yeah. you to join back the queue sir uh sure thank you we have a next question from the line of anirudh shetty from solidarity investment managers please go ahead hi hi thanks for giving me this opportunity i had two questions uh so my first question is you know within protection we have uh, you know this uh, employer employee uh, type of protection so just want to understand as of today what is our share of like what is the uh, percentage uh, of premium that comes in this segment and Uh, from a long term perspective do we see this as strategic to us or this is more of a you know a tactical business wherein where the pricing is right we could consider it, but it's not uh, you know core to i said said to and uh, my second question is uh, you know your opening remarks had mentioned that uh, you know your guaranteed product is uh, you know not very large as a share of business so if you could just quantify how much comes from this interest rate guaranteed business and um and just another question here is that some of our peers have a larger share of business coming from this category and uh they claim that they are able to hedge it quite well so uh, what would uh, explain our hesitation uh, in growing this uh, you know business to a you know larger percentage you know more closer to what our peers are doing today yeah we didn't intend yeah hi anurag so uh, in terms of the group term business i think uh, some of the improvement in protection share that you've seen over the past few years has come through group term uh, so to think of it as a one off and uh, a tactical move i think is the wrong way uh, we've fundamentally been able to establish our position quite well in the group term market uh, because we've been able to invest in our uh, group sales business for the past many many years uh, and so we've held the relationship uh, all this while especially in the period of covid when there weren't that many uh, companies quoting uh, to uh, clients we were the ones who were uh, willing to quote and uh, quote appropriately uh, of course covid was a evolving scenario at that time and we were able to uh, correct prices as they went through uh, fundamentally this is part and parcel of our uh, strategic element and i don't think we are uh, treating this as a one off uh, in that aspect uh, coming to your second question that you called out fundamentally the way we look at the non far guaranteed uh, business is that at the core of it it caters to the mass mass affluent customer uh, which means that there there is synchron there is adjacency between the participating and the non participating business uh, there may be shifts between these two businesses depending upon the interest rate environment uh, but fundamentally they would uh, cater to the similar set of consumers which is why we have called them out as a traditional business uh, in our uh, disclosures Uh, of course what also happened over the past couple of years is that given the interest rate cycle and the steepness of the yield curve uh, there were of course some element of pickup that was coming in from affluent customers uh, but that was a transient uh, point and as you see the uh, new taxation rules uh, there is of course some hesitancy that would come in from that particular set uh, even though we think that uh from a long term perspective uh, these sets of products even at about 5 lakhs even if being taxed uh, completely do make a lot of sense because they do take away reinvestment risk so from a uh, uh, from the assets available that the customer may be able to invest money in this should definitely form part of their portfolio uh 
Coming to your third question on whether we're able to hedge it, I think we've been very, very categorical. Uh, the reason we did not step into this market uh, four years back was because of the lack of heavy instruments. As instruments were made available primarily through frogs, we grew that business quite well. Uh, we run a very, very tight strategy in terms of hedging, and uh, we also run a tight strategy in terms of repricing. Uh, that is how we've been able to manage uh, any residual risk that comes out of the, this book. And it's extremely important to recognize that this particular book is actually managed tightly from a hedging perspective, because world over, insurance companies have gone down for mismanaging interest rate risk. I don't think insurance companies have gone down from a mortality rate mortality risk perspective. Uh, so this is a portion that we have been extremely uh, watching very, very closely, and uh, we continue to work on that. Uh, when we mentioned that a small portion of the book comes in from this pool, it's obviously from the overall book and not just the incremental uh, segment, Anirudh. Yeah, Anirudh, just one thing I wanted to clarify. You know, over a period of last few years, our effort has been to be most comprehensive product provider, which takes care of consumer preference changes that may happen because of the environment change. So once we complete the product portfolio, which could be, you know, within savings, link, non-link, within link, it is equity, debt, balanced, within non-link, it is participating or non-participating, we allow the environment to take over and consumer preference to eventually decide what they want to buy. After that, we don't carry a bias against a bid in a one category of products. We allow it to play out the way it is. And we build capabilities over a period of time to adjust to that. And that is what exactly we did. When we saw an opportunity on the guarantee side, we adjusted our capability to deliver on what consumer preference was. And that's when the heavy opportunity came and we capitalized and converted and catered to the consumer preference search. <coughs> Got it. Uh, and would it be possible to quantify how much uh, of our premium in Q1 FI24 comes from this uh, uh, guaranteed products and how much comes from this uh, employer employee protection? Now, we've not called those numbers out, Anirudh. We've been consistent about the way that we put out our disclosures. Uh, and I think uh, at one level, like I explained earlier, the way we look at the traditional book uh, is fundamentally because of the fact that this caters to a different set of consumers. And uh, the interesting mix between the two can vary at uh, a point in time depending upon the rate cycle. Okay, no problem. Thank you for answering my questions. Thanks, Thank Anirudh. We have our next question from the line of Shashank Mundra, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. So I was seeing the margin. So it, it has drawn Y over here despite uh, being a high protection uh, business mix, which is, I think, 70, 80% plus uh, margin. So I want to understand the reason uh, behind uh, the drop in the margin. And another one is on the uh, cost side, despite the uh, business being flattish, uh, the expenses have increased uh, so much. Thanks. Yeah, Shishank. Hi, Dehan here. So I uh, picked up this margin question earlier, and uh, uh, the reason for that is basically the interesting mix between the product profiles. Uh, where at one level, yes, you're right, retail protection has gone up. Uh, as we discussed earlier, there has been a drop in uh, group term. Uh, similarly, in the uh, high-value non-par guaranteed segment, that has dropped. Uh, to some extent, those customers have gone towards the participating and more towards uh, unit lead. Uh, so it's essentially the underlying product profile that has resulted in this uh, margin that you see here. Having said that, uh, margin is not a focus, as, as we've been reiterating on the call. Uh, I think our, uh, our vision is to be able to grow absolute VNB. Uh, and uh, given the way that the product profiles have actually tran uh, transformed over the past four years, I think the core driver of VNB is going to be absolute AP. To that extent, while we've had a drop in uh, AP in the quarter, uh, that is the core driver of where the VNB drop is. Having said that, uh, through the quarter also, we've seen improvements in uh, sequential improvements in absolute AP, so much so that in the month of June, we've been able to double digit uh, growth numbers. Uh, the cost numbers, of course, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, also had risen. Uh, some of the larger cost elements where this has gone up has been on employee cost, as we've been investing in adding more people on the ground, uh, fundamentally along uh, ETC, along uh, new banks, along new partnerships, and uh, other elements of uh, distribution uh, uh, cost as well. Okay. 
uh, okay and one more thing you mentioned about the agent termination in one of the earlier question so uh, i assume there must be some uh, cost if you don't terminate some inactive uh, agent no, so that that's a good so, question uh, shashank uh, fundamentally the way we look at agents is because these are completely commissioned agents it doesn't cost us to keep them on books uh the first point of uh, fixed cost and the efficiency that the fixed cost element uh, draws out is what is very critical and that is the manager on the ground uh so to be able to manage productivities of the managers who manage these agents is what becomes very critical when you're looking at agency uh, productivity and profitability uh i'd also like to add that you know we spoke about the fact that we've been on a digitalization journey for many years and in fact we've actually built out an agent platform uh which allows uh, stands of these uh, frontline managers to run as low as 10 to 12 to as high as 200 uh and again because it doesn't really cost us to keep these agents on books we pay no fixed cost uh we're able to eke out uh, even from a, a long term perspective some of these uh, businesses as well so yes it while it looks like an agent productivity which would be the total ap divided by the 200000 agents looks like not so great as compared to rest of our peers so i think more important would be look at productivity at a frontline level yeah okay thanks thank you we have a next question from the line of nidesh jain from investec please go ahead uh thanks for the opportunity sir uh, firstly uh, uh, how should we think about uh, the vnb margins going forward uh do we think that we have already made the required investments is for required to scale ap growth or that uh, will still uh, is ahead of us and which will have some which will probably drive ap growth but may but may have impact on bnb margins going forward so nidhi uh, again no guidance on bnb margin uh, absolute bnb growth is what we seek uh again a lot of it would be a function of the product profile that comes through as amit also pointed out earlier essentially we're laying bare the entire product profile and as anu pointed out what we're seeking to see is what is the specific product that can fit a particular customer through that specific distribution channel so understanding the nuance of the distribution channels to see what kind of customers they have and what they for what are the products that we could uh, uh, we could sell uh, to them the outcome of all of that is what we would uh, end up in terms of the bnb margin again we hold no targets on bnb margin absolute growth in bnb is what we seek and again based on the way the product profile comes through we will uh, take it as it comes like i give you an example with this you know like what we mentioned that uh, changing the consumer preference uh, whenever it happens we want to be there uh, catering to customers uh, change requirements like for instance what we saw towards the end of the quarter is where large value deals which typically were coming in non participating uh, platform we started seeing large part of this business shifting towards unit linked products right so internally at the organization level we don't uh, get uh, partial towards any one category of products if customer started choosing unit linked products we were more than happy to serve them through that and that is what is evident in the way we have looked at our average premiums in non participating and unit linked so unit linked went up by 10% and non participating went down by 10% so it was all about consumer deciding as to what it is so to answer your question on the end the margin outlook while absolutely right what dhiran mentioned that we will not be guided on margin percentage we will allow the ecosystem and the environment to drive the margins for us we will stay focused on the drivers that we have identified for our distribution uh, through which we intend to deliver our ap growth I think that is what we will focus more uh, as a controllable rest the market forces and the environment will take over. Sure. So uh, just to follow up on that, that so if you look at last four year journey for us, uh, we have uh, uh, we have delivered on BNB growth uh, despite a lot of headwinds that we were facing. Uh, but in the process, we have maxed out on my, uh, uh, product mix changes. Uh, we have probably probably also uh, invested less in our distribution at least till FY22. In FY23, probably we started the, this investment journey in our uh, in the distribution. Uh, so how should how where are we currently in the investment journey? Or do we think our uh, investment will continue to accelerate going forward in FY24, uh, leading to sharp, uh, sharp growth in cost ratios because uh, of its top line growth that we have seen in Q1? Is, is that likely to continue in FY24-25 or not? Absolutely, absolutely. We want to stay invested in building capacity. I think proprietary channels already are close to half of our business today, and we want to stay invested there and want to build capacity. 
uh, as you rightly mentioned, Nidesh, uh, in between during COVID, uh, adding to capacity would have added cost without any bottom line or top line because you know gestation period uh, for settling into uh, reasonable productivity is much longer in propriety channels. And hence, for uh, a very reasonable reason, we stayed away from investing during times which were very uh, difficult. Uh, and we were banking mostly on efficiency and productivity enhancement of our existing distribution. So the journey that we started 2015 months back, we want to continue. And the next couple of years, we want to stay investing relentlessly. And that is what, like I mentioned in the previous uh, question, to the previous question as well, uh, almost five to seven percent of our ABC business we are seeing coming through from the additional capacity that we built in last 12 months. And that is something that will continue. So this is incrementally going to only add and become significant as we go deep into the year and even the coming financial year. But that will only happen if we continue investing. And that is what is one of the reasons also that we invested in first quarter. We did not stop. Uh, though for seasonality of business, typically you see much lower business in quarter one. So percentages look higher in the, in the earlier quarters. But as you go deep, it will all get squared up. Sure, sir. And in FA19, we put out our explanation to the to join back the queue, sir. Uh, sure. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Sanket Goda from Avendis Park. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I, I just wanted to check on this uh, protection business again, that, that, that uh, probably there was a campaign run on uh, 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 running bank or even the agency channel and even, even in, to some extent in policy bazaar. That, uh, that the price hike is coming in, so so uh, so so that uh, just I wanted to understand that that led to like like an upfronting of the growth in the current quarter in the individual production business. That's point number one, and and if the price hike is coming, uh, just just wanted to understand uh, the reason for it because because I don't see any competitor increasing price. Have we changed our reinvestment strategy because we have a different reinvestment strategy compared to the peers? So 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 just wanted to understand that part a little better uh, on on protection. And, and second question was uh, more more um, on, on margin again. Uh, I mean, there should be some some level where you might be thinking that beyond be, below this number, um, I am not comfortable to go margin. Whether whether that number is 30 or 29 or 28, I'm not sure. Uh, but but there is some there should be some number in your mind probably beyond which the margins uh, going down might not be comfortable. So so at that point of time, you will take a calibrated step on on more product mix rather than just chasing chasing what customer wants. So, so just wanted to understand these two parts uh, from you. Okay, so uh, Sanke, let me try addressing first of all this protection part. I think the protection pricing part that you are quoting, actually this is an ongoing exercise that we keep doing. You know, internally, uh, in a committee-based approach, we keep looking at profiles in various cohorts and keep looking at our risk to pricing uh, 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 balance between the two. And we do correct our pricing uh, on a regular basis. Now, this is something which is not uh, periodic, but it is something that we take stock every month. Sometimes we may decide to increase pricing in some cohorts, and, and some months we may decide not to. So it is generally at some pockets and some cohorts where we find an experience where it necessitates us to correct pricing, and that is what we do. Uh, it has no implication on demand going forward to that extent because uh, protection product is more or less not standardized in terms of pricing, which is much of a discussion that we have seen in the industry. So to that extent, there is nothing in terms of demand which is affronted because of some price change that have happened in the, in the past. So that is on protection part. Second, on, on margins, you spoke about uh, what is the bare minimum. So let me answer by saying that, you know, uh, the biggest driver, if you were to ask me, you know, as to what we should be doing to look at enhancing our overall margins, uh, if at all, we, of course, to reach out to customer segments where uh, the natural demand of the products from those customer segments is the one where uh -huh. where, where uh, we see uh, same as margin equity. For instance, typically mass and mass affluent, where the entire industry is going to be focused on uh, to increase width and increase number of policies by reaching and penetrating more and more. Uh, Anu spoke about the fact that current penetration being 0.7%, 1%, 1.5% across various partnerships. I think if you were to move towards 5% kind of a number, you have to go deeper and go beyond affluent, go to mass and mass affluent. And there, naturally, you will understand that probably simplified products like participating and non-participating will make more meaningful sense. So our effort will be to increase width, reach out to more and more customers, increase penetration, 
and by virtue of reaching out to this customer segment, but probably, you know, you will see a category of products uh, will start growing where probably margin acquisition is relatively better in comparison to what we see in unison products. And just coming here, uh, just to add to what uh, you know, Deeran and Amit said, on this margin management thing, there are a couple of questions that come on the margin management. So, what is what is the approach and philosophy of margin management? So, margin management essentially just mathematically is a function of product. Yeah. Now, if it is a function of product mix, then it is then a function, but ultimately it emanates from the customer segment. So, what we have seen is that there is a wide ranging quality parameter on when you triangulate the persistency, uh, the product and the customer's quote. And wherever we have seen that the customer suitability and the product suitability is not right, there the persistency drops perceptibly. Yeah. Right. And wherever there is a customer suitability and the product suitability is there, even after five years, we have seen 90% plus persistency. Although the market persistency, as you know, on the 65, you know better, Sanket, is yeah. hovering around 50s, mid 50s and 60s, but we have seen 90%. Right. Then the real question that comes back is that why is it that some people are at that level and some people are at 90 plus? The real answer to that, and that's the only answer to that, is that wherever the product suitability is proper, and there is continual customer engagement, you get high customer propensity because that is where the customer needed the product, they understand the product, and it is well well sold, and it is well accepted, and then your engagement, and so the ops follow-up doesn't happen, that they forget whether to pay premium, not pay premium, and they understand that these are locked-up products, and they understand why they have brought the product. Then the question really is that if you really want to do margin management, then we have to find out players of such products and such customers. So if you don't diversify on products and you just allow the customer to play, they obviously will pick up a particular kind of product if you put a control on quality. And so while your quality may be good, if you don't diversify your product customer base, you will have lesser growth but you will have quality growth and you will have our product. Now that our product depends on, it could be a low margin product, it could be a high margin product. Mm -hmm. Now as a company, you cannot allow that fully. So because ultimately VND will come from margin multiplied by the top line growth. Mm -hmm. And so, and so uh, because of the heterogeneity of the partners that we have, we have seen that you have all kinds of customer codes within us within our customer partners base. And so we are digging deeper into the partners base to see which are the kind of cohort and which are the kind of products cohort that you bring and you pair them for higher quality business. And then you go after that one by one by one by one and make sure that the channel is activated for that product through the channel for the correct customer segment. And that is the way in which your quality also will be maintained, your growth will also come, and your margin will also come. And that is going to be our approach. And we have seen, working very closely with partners, that wherever we have done this kind of a workshop, we have seen that the green shoots are very good. And they understand it, and it is easy, and then the partners don't see it purely as a fee income, it is a fee income product but they also see it as a part of the overall bouquet of products where they will get attachment for a long period of time. And if you are a bank, where ultimately you require attachment for you to lower the volatility of your liability, lower the volatility of your, of your customer, this is a very, very good product because it is of the product and if understood well, you have to sell it only to 10, 15% of the income, just like you cannot over, over leverage in, in lending, you cannot over leverage in insurance as well, otherwise you'll have persistency problem. Right. So this is a slightly multivariable issue that we have to solve, and that is the approach that we are taking, and this is the approach that is going to be useful to us, and I'm very confident that it is going to be useful to us, and I'm also very confident that the game that we have to play is not 0.71% going to 1.1. The I we have to keep is two. Of course, we have to month over month, month over month, quarter over quarter, we have to grow. But really, the big problems that we have to solve within our company is how do you set up the foundation that you can go from 1% to 10%?
and how do you do the full penetration on the customer base? How do you understand the barrier to adoptive adoption? How do you understand that why customers don't buy? And you get to know why customers don't buy from the customers who buy. And which is the which is the pair, which is the agent, which is the channel through which the customers buy in a more persistent manner without complaints. So really, I thought I'll just answer it comprehensively because what I was hearing uh, is that these are uh, these coming across as disjointed questions. It is actually just one big problem that has to be solved, of course, by breaking this into four or five variables, but doing it in a cohesive, integrated manner. Perfect, sir. Perfect. This is very useful. Yeah, uh, thanks. And, and just, just on the question, I, I request you to join back the queue, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please restrict your question to one at a time so that the management is able to answer queries from all participants. We'll take our next question from the line of Sham Srinivasan from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Just the first one, uh, just the only one on ULIP. Uh, I think in the opening remarks, there was a mention that ULIP demand is starting to come back. Um, so, and maybe it's also a result of this, you know, tax uh, breaks going away. So just want to understand what are the demand dynamics here. It still is a 40% uh, kind of a AP contribution. So when we talk about growth, both AP and VNB, um, you know, can you talk about what's happening on the ULIP demand dynamics and also the constant maturity product. Uh, thought process behind it, was it a missing product in our portfolio? So any any color here will be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. When, it, when it comes to the philosophy of product, essentially the constant maturity came up because on the mutual fund side, the tax advantages have gone up. Here the tax advantages remain the same and there are a segment of customers who don't want to take, of course, UDIP is associated essentially with equity, I must admit, or at best balance advantage fund equivalent. But there are a certain set of customers who want their uh, wealth to get compounded in a tax-free manner for a long period of time, and that is where this product comes in. Like I said, essentially it is not about coming out with a product, it is about understanding is there a positioning that there is a product positioning for a segment of customers and then searching for those customers, segment of customers, and which channels can that be paired to with what product. And that is where, so we are seeing reasonable traction on the product, and customers who have taken this product, they seem to be generally happy, uh, because it is clear that they are taking, for example, in constant maturity products, that they are taking a dead product, and they should not expect equity type of return. I think selling and expectation is very, very critical. All of us in this call belong to financial services and it's important that everything is against an expectation. And so disappointment and happiness all comes against expectation. So this is a product that is basically tuned for that kind of customer segment through, the, through these kind of channels. So these are not traditional equity ULIP kind of channels also. That also we are seeing. And, uh, but they search for this kind of uh, products and then they... Uh, sell it, and the experience so far has been quite quite good. So, just on the first question, will it overall non constant maturity? Non constant maturity, I think what has happened is a little bit of spillover has happened greater than 5 lakh uh, because they are affluent. Uh, affluent essentially, if you look at ULIP and if you look at ULIP equity, they were all non affluent types. So, part of the spillover has come to ULIP. But uh, but it is forty percent, so there is it's not too much of a deviation from our general uh, product mix. Dira, yeah, yeah. specifically specifically if you were to in unit link business, there is a, a bit of a channel color as well that we have internally, which is very unique to us. If you were to keep ICICI uh, uh, ICICI unit aside. And then you will see actually some 11 percent kind of growth on link business that we have seen uh, in channels other than ICHA. And that is largely contributed by uh, what we witnessed in the second half of the quarter, where large value deals, instead of coming in non participating range of products, started coming in unit link business. And that is when it coincided with CMF launch, constant maturity fund launch. And since the story uh, came at a time when uh, the number of options available for uh, tax savings, relative tax savings, was very attractive on this kind of a platform. And we saw an uptick uh, in the channel other than ICSA. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Shreya Shivani from CLSA. Please go ahead. 
Hi, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. First is uh, on the credit life business. So, uh, in the annual report uh, for the full year, uh, you've given about 4.8 billion of credit life. Uh, in previous years, you used to give us the breakup of uh, credit life between ICICI and other banks. If you could help me with that. Also, any color on uh, what kind of attachment rates are we seeing in the other banks? Because I'm assuming that the majority of the growth should be coming from that segment. First is that, and second is just a clarification. You said. Um, that agency channel in May and June grew at 20-23 percent. Does that is that correct? Because that implies a 50 percent decline in uh, April. So just these two from me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So on, on the second question, yes, agency broadly right. Uh, you got the numbers broadly right there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so as you as you know that uh, uh, there is generally uh, a traction of spillover business that happens from March to April. Yeah. And that has been the trend in the past. And this year being special, most of the logins that we experienced in the last week of March was issued uh, by us March itself because there was sensitivity around the tax proposition. Hence, we, we actually dislodge ourselves from April performance because large part of spillover, which was a trend in the past, uh, did not happen for us this year. Hence, April looks a little skewed, but you are right. Uh, May June is 20 and 22 percent growth for agency, uh, and and resultant is whatever we saw in the month of April. On the second first question that you asked on credit life, we actually don't uh, share specifically channel wise uh, numbers on this. But if you ask me about on, on attachments, uh, see this is something that we completely go by our partner priority. You know, depending upon the type of customers, the type of businesses they are in, whether it is MFI, whether it is home loan, personal loan, uh, vehicle loans, you know that credit like today is being sold across category of loan products. And we have seen attachment rates are varying from product category to product category, and also depending upon partner priorities, right? So, so to that extent, there is no standard number that I can reply you, uh, uh, with. But it varies from partner to partner. Got it. That's useful. Thank you. Thank you. So that number varies uh, as such, uh, Shreya, in terms of what is the share that I, of ICC bank that comes in. Uh, it can be between a quarter to uh, half, depending upon the period. Yeah, because last three years, FI 20 to 22, the annual report did have a breakup of credit life between ICS and other ones. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of it also is uh, addition of credit life across uh, new partners. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's where some of the growth is coming from. Okay, got it, got it. Yeah, Thank I, you. We have our next question from the line of Arvind R. from Sundaram Alternates. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, since we're talking about the agents, you know, some of them uh, being not uh, not active, uh, can you give some color on you know number of active agents uh, uh, in the system? So, as we did not call that out, like I said, one of the core reasons is uh, looking at total APE and uh, looking at channel economics. It makes more sense to look at what is the front line. Uh, that we have. And uh, also, as I mentioned, given the way that we manage the channel using our digital platform, a span from uh, for these unit managers can be as low as 10, which can go all the way up to 200 as well. So I think it, uh, uh, it, it becomes a little more important to kind of look at uh, what the channel delivers in terms of absolute uh, uh, AP, because end of the day, the agent is completely variable for us. So in the cases commission, only if he performs and uh, delivers business, if he doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, so that's the way we actually run that business. And it's not looking at number of uh, agents that we have overall on our book that, uh, that we're uh, chasing at any point. Uh, at, obviously, at some point in time, they will, uh, through the year, there will be a, an, a change in number of agents who are active at that point. But again, it's also a function of the underlying uh, uh, nature of those agents. Some of them are far more professional. Some of them are uh, semi-professional. And so to that extent, their activity levels will vary through the year. Just one more question, if you can, if it be permitted. Like, uh, I understand, like, you are talking about, you know, it uh, is upon, uh, it is with the, you know, digital of the ICHA bank itself. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, business per branch of uh, bank, uh, when compared to other peers, it's uh, one of the lowest uh, uh, among the peers. Like, so is there any uh, target or something in mind, you know, to improve that? Uh, 
to some average levels uh, in the industry that's what i'm thinking i was in the referring to uh, icic bank productivity per branch yes 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 so i think we've discussed quite a bit on icic bank's philosophy on what they uh, what they're looking at from a third party perspective and uh, when you put that out i don't think uh, comparing icic bank's per branch productivity with any other bank would make uh, you know would be would be natural to all comparison actually uh the bank is very clear that their kind of products that they focus on are going to be protection and annuity and uh, given those ticket sizes it obviously is going to be much less than that of uh, other products oh, okay okay thank you thank you we have a next question from the line of supratin datta from ambit capital please go ahead Yeah, I just one follow up question. So, from April this year, the new IRD guideline has come in, and which has removed product wise commission caps. So, just wanted to understand how has that resulted in you know some of the negotiations with the non ICICI bank partners? How how are commissions there now trending post these changes? So, so pretty much the short answer to that is this is still an evolving scenario. uh there are conversations on uh, at some level one would expect commission to go up uh but from a company perspective i think what we would seek to do is to keep overall uh, unit cost uh, broadly stable across where we were uh because end of the day there is only so much that can be uh, put into the product from a pricing perspective and so if there is going to be an increased commission then there is going to be a reduced uh, set of operating expenses that will have to happen there uh but i don't think the market has stabilized at this point uh that is our sense is some of the conversations uh yes to some level in some cases there have been some increases in commission but i don't think all of it has played out i think we'll get a much better picture as we go through to the end of the year uh this could just be a little premature at this point got it thank you thank you we have a next question from the line of neeraj toshniwal from ups india please go ahead Yeah, hi. Uh, my first question is on the yield. Uh, since we discussed that we are selling products driven by demand, so I just wanted to understand uh, anything we are doing towards increasing the product level margin, uh, particularly for yield, because uh, the last call I think uh, we discussed that the margin will normalize to a much lower level and would remain as is. So that is the case of the current season strategy. Uh, so you can see the margin might improve from from that level. Uh, so Neera taking a question on uh, ULIP margin i think by regulation there is only so much that a ULIP uh, product can deliver in terms of margin uh, there could be variations from year to year period to period depending upon how efficient we are in that uh, period but uh, i i don't think this is going to be like a high double digit uh, kind of a margin product at all i think the guidelines are fairly clear in terms of what has to be given to customer and so to that extent uh, i this is not going to be a fairly high margin relatively speaking but again as we have said before it's a question of where is the customer opportunity uh, this product clearly caters to a affluent customer segment uh, if they're able to sell much much more than what we would have sold in another customer segment then clearly it gets rmd on the table uh because again i come back to the first point we are not guided with margin we are looking at growth in absolute bnb this is a opportunity pool that we should not be letting go of traditionally you know we've had great strength in this pool we continue to have strength in this uh, segment uh, and we'll continue to innovate and bring new products that would be relevant for customers in this segment and one example of that is this uh, constant maturity fund that we launched uh, in the month of uh, may clearly that was a opportunity we saw given all of the changes that were happening in the environment and the fact that there wasn't a credible uh, uh, offering from the uh, life insurance table which is where we moved quickly and got that out what uh, my question is to toshniwal i request you to join by thank you sir thank you we have a next question from the line of sahej mittal from 3p investment managers please go ahead Mr. Sahij Mittal, please unmute your line and go ahead with your question. Since there is no response, we'll move on to the next question from the line of Akshay Thakkar from Fidelity. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, just a couple of. Oh, questions. so we are unable to hear you. Can you use your handset, please? Is it better? It's a little bit action. Yeah. Okay. So, couple of questions. One, one on retail protection. Strong growth this quarter. Uh, you know, in the past two to three years, we've spoken about constraint in terms of underwriting, in terms of uh, you know ability to uh, for customers to pay that much. Now, if when you think, I'm not saying this year, this quarter, etc. Just the next two to three years, uh, would you would you say that this business is now got back to a run rate where you feel confident that it will deliver the kind of growth uh, that which an underpenetrated category like this deserves? That's question one. I'll wait for you to answer and then ask follow-up question. Okay, so uh, Ashwin, I think uh, we're getting a lot more confident in the, in the numbers that are being generated on a month-to-month -month basis. Uh, there's a lot more stability that we see. Uh, of course, as you pointed out, in the past few years, uh, the environment challenge was a key factor in the drop that we saw in uh, retail protection. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier also, we have been uh, working hard actually at a unit level to try and understand what are the core drivers be it at the sales side, be it at the operation side, be it at the underwriting side, and within story working at addressing these uh, over these years. So as we stand today, I think we've moved uh, in a much further direction, and uh, we're getting a lot more confident in the way the numbers are actually shaping up. Uh, can we do more? Of course we can do more. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we fundamentally think that this is a multi decadal opportunity. Uh, we're not shying away from that. It was essentially coming out of that period of adjustment that we had to uh, work through. And uh, as we see it, I think we're far, far better uh, positioned today than what we were, uh, let's say, a year back. Amit, would you want that? Yeah, so uh, just to explain it further and understand what happened in protection over the last few years, I just want to mention that one part of congestion was created because of underwriting policies becoming stringent on account of unforeseen impact on mortality risk, which was envisaged uh, during COVID. So that is one factor that you can now, uh, you know, factor that, you know, this is no longer as big a fear or apprehension as it was two years back. So experience is definitely much better than what uh, we thought few years back, which is leading to process becoming simpler. Two, um, Anil mentioned that uh, congestion uh, actually by by natural process over a period of last few years has actually eased out because of the overall data which is available in the ecosystem. So everything to do with process today, our ability to get KYC from the customers, get income documents from the customer is getting easier and easier and newer options are emerging to make process more seamless for the customer. So I want to believe that one, because of experience, two, because of ecosystem data, uh, processes are becoming simpler. And third element, which is also critical, is the distribution reset. Because distribution was selling protection in a certain way till FI17, FI18, and subsequent to COVID, it had to take some time to reset and, and follow a different regime of selling protection. So all three things have contributed towards retail protection now turning it out. So I do believe that all these three are quite sustainable uh, because ecosystem will only get stronger and stronger. The ecosystem will get data rich. Uh, experience, I don't see it uh, uh, undergoing any drastic change because all those calamities are behind us. And the distribution reset has already happened. So more and more participation we will see from distribution going forward as well. Correct. Great. Thanks for that answer. Uh, second, Irene, to you, a little bit of a housekeeping question. Um, you know, you mentioned that growth in April was a little bit of mute, little muted because you know, March month had seen a big bump up in premium growth. When we think through growth for the full year, would you say that, the, you know, uh, the extra bump that you got in March, the effect of that would have played out in Q1 largely? Or do you think as we look at growth in Q4, you will have some residual impact on, on YOI growth in Q4 as well? Just trying to handicap, not looking at exact numbers, just directionally how are we thinking about that? Yeah, so April was uh, not a great month. And I think to some extent we were fairly clear that we needed to get the uh, operational efficiency fairly high in the month of March, given that some of the policies uh, were in the traditional pool. And some of them, of course, were in the more than 5 lakh range. And there was no way that we want to let those spill over into the month of uh, uh, April. Uh, so. Typically, 
actually April is one of those months where there is new business generation that is quite low. Uh, that has been the case of the industry. And depending upon different years, uh, looking at whatever spillover comes through because you are unable to issue all the cases in the month of March, uh, you see some of the April numbers shape up. But having gone beyond that, I think looking at May and June are the ones that are more uh, critical. Uh, and there you could see even within, as you've disclosed earlier as well, uh, there has been a sharp movement up in terms of the overall business for uh, the month of uh, June, uh, sequentially as well as on a YOI basis. Uh, we, we continue to see those trends even now. And the way we look at it is that uh, while quarter one is only about 15% of the overall business, we are cognizant of the fact that uh, March last year was a fairly strong uh, March. Uh, and therefore, it's important for us to be able to drive growth in the balance month as we go through to the end of the year. Uh, so I'm not giving a set of numbers difficult to call out, but effectively uh, there is a certain amount of color that I can provide in terms of what we're driving towards. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it will be a volatile year, but I think Q2 and Q3 from what you're saying should give a better reflection of the growth cadence in your business rather than looking at Q1 or Q4 or full year numbers because there'll be a lot of noise either side of the quarter. So you're right. You. You're right. Yeah. And, yeah. and and Akshan, as we spoke of earlier, the one of the core drivers of VMB development is going to be AP growth, and therefore this is clearly top of our mind. Not that it wasn't top of our mind earlier. I think people are not able to appreciate the overall uh, movement across those channels, uh, given the uh, preponderance of some of our uh, channels that were not doing so well. Uh, but as you now see that uh, portions of the business are much smaller. Uh, overall, you can start to see the AP growth come through quite strongly. All right, great. Thank you, guys, uh, guys and all, all the best for the rest of the year. Thanks, Akshin. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Dipanjan Ghosh from City. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good evening. Uh, just two questions. Uh, one on the persistency improvement. Uh, can I give some color on whether it is led by um, mixed change on the product side that you've seen or uh, on the individual product classes also you're witnessing um, improvement across cohorts. And second, if you can give some color on your uh, individual uh, writer attachment rates uh, that, uh, across uh, across your policies that you're seeing and whether there has been any trend shift on that particular segment out there. So on persistency, uh, difference in answer is both. We're seeing some improvements at the uh, LOB level as well as uh, some amount of mixed change. Uh, and the first one is what is more critical. I think irrespective of where the product mix, underlying product mix is, it's important for us to be able to deliver on persistency because that's essentially the promise that we've got from the customer. Uh, so all efforts are on towards uh, improving the unit level persistency as well. Uh, in terms of riders, I think they're quite small at this stage. Uh, we just started another drive on uh, improving rider attachments. Uh, let's see how that shapes up through the year. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you and all the best. Thank you, Pan. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Nishin Savate from Kotak. Please go ahead. Yeah, fortunately. Uh, you know, now that we sort of look back, uh, you know, over the last six months and, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of say that March was extraordinarily a strong month, uh, which, which obviously had a rub off in this quarter. Uh, would you want to call off the extraordinary in the month of March? Call out, uh, call out extraordinary in March. So, uh, I, I don't think that's a fair question from the perspective that if we hadn't taken the business on the table, you would have asked a different question of us now. So, I think it's, uh, we took, we saw the business, we took it, and uh, I think we move on to the coming quarter. Uh, we know it wasn't that large overall. Uh, but clearly, we know our uh, what what our work has to be from a what's cut out perspective. Um, important to see that on a sequential basis, you are seeing positive trends. Uh, and like I said, coming into June, it is a, a double-digit growth number, and uh, that's what we want to build on. Uh, I guess the, 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 where I'm coming in is that uh, for the for March this year, you probably kind of going to be looking at growth over growth, right? Or it's not. Something that we, think, uh, we want to stay optimistic because uh, March is still quite far away, and I'm sure the journey that we have started doing on building capacity will also start playing out through the year. Right? So, so there are a lot of things that we probably have built up over a period of last 15 months, 
and that only will go and become more and more efficient and productive as we go deep. So Mark is still far away. I'm sure we will work towards uh, filling up uh, for the filling up for the uh, scale up in Mars to the built up capacity uh, in next few months. Uh, so still these kind of uh, see uh, Anup here. See these are two independent questions. Uh, was there March was a strong uh, month? Of course, March was a strong month because there was an event, and so March was a strong month. Should we have taken the business? Yes, we should have taken the business. I leave the business if the March is strong. You don't leave a business or you don't take the business thinking that year on year next year will be low. So that's an independent thing. Now, whether the next March will be strong or weak is a function of what capacities we are building and what is the market opportunity there. Our general focus and our approach will be that, you know, whatever be the March, last March, we will see it's an independent thing. It's a, it's a thing that is behind us. We have to look forward and ensure that we have to keep growing and we have to build capacities for growth. And whether March was, March was good or bad, you know, we will see, we will want to make last March and not any March. And uh, we will all, you know, push and focus to make it in an ordinary March. Uh, so that it, when you look back, you say that while it was an extraordinary march, your growth is so strong that it was an ordinary march. So this is also my request to Amit and team. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, on the product strategy side, uh, you know, it looks like Ulip is kind of making a comeback. And uh, I think at the same time, you are investing in the franchise, investing in the agency force. Typically, uh, you know, the trend that we have seen over the last three years is that, you know, agency tends to be sort of no more non-link heavy than ULIPS, uh, uh, prob probably probably maybe driven by persistency outcomes. So how do you see, you know, both adding up, you know, in terms of... No, no, good question, good question, good question. I am not seeing, see, uh, ULIPS, see, we have all products. And what happens when the market in general is good, etc., there is a bit of shift towards ULIPS. Also because uh, non parts that guarantee has moved off, some part has shifted towards ULIPS, but our sense is that, you know, it is not as if there is a secular trend moving towards ULIP and it will not go back. It is for us to discover different customer segments and come out with more suitable products to manage our product mix so that we are a balanced company. Now, of course, through a channel which is, let's say, more ULIP focused and if they have got ULIP customers, they obviously will sell more ULIP. But then it is up to us to also find out other channels, develop other customer cohorts, uh, so that we get both balance. So I think that is nearer to to the situation. I don't think it's a secular thing. When the market moves, you know, UDP is a market-focused uh, business. So when it moves, it moves. And when it moves, uh, one should take. Now, so Mr. just to add uh, a thought like what uh, Anit and one of his answers to the previous question mentioned. Idea is not to say no to Unit. Let Unit grow in absolutes. But how to reach out to customer segments who need a product which is different from Unit. And that is the journey that we have started. Uh, it's, a, it's a journey which is about understanding customer segments of our partners. And with only 1% kind of penetration that our partners have, I'm sure there are customers which are beyond affluent who may need products other than Unit. And that is the journey that we have to traverse. And that is what we have started working on. I think absolute growth in Unit is welcome. But at the same time, uh, we have a task uh, laid out in terms of what we want to do to increase width by increasing number of policies and segments beyond the other customers. Very much and all the best. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Mohit Mangal from BOB Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, my first question is towards the annuity. So we saw annuity declining, and if you look at last three to four quarters, we saw a very strong growth. So what went wrong this quarter in the annuity business? Yeah, so I'll take that. Uh, first of all, let me just put in context that uh, last year we had an introduction in one of our new products on a regular prison platform. So, so last year, first quarter was a good 60% plus kind of a growth for us in annuity. So it was one, it was on a very large base that we saw annuity growth declining. That is one, which is a very technical, uh, Excel file, mathematical explanation. The second thing which I want to articulate here is that if you were to segregate annuity business into regular premium products and single premium products, 
then we actually saw a constrained constrained growth in single premium products. Right, so regular premium continued to grow at around 30-40% uh, for us uh, in this quarter. However, single premium was impacted. Uh, as you know that you know currently rates available in deposits uh, are at an all-time high at this point in time, and some of our bank partners uh, did prioritize at this point in time to look at the deposit mobilization as a primary objective. But we believe that it is transient. Uh, eventually, you know, uh, what the regular premium annuity product serves is a customer who is nearing retirement against uh, a customer segment which is who is already retired when it comes to single premium product. So it's not a customer segment issue; it is a transient issue, which we do believe that uh, demand will come back as we go deep into the year. All right, very clear. Th- thanks, and all the best. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Prayesh Jain from Motila Loswal. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Just a couple of questions. Uh, firstly, uh, you know, the five black plus ticket size. What would be the share of that premium in one Q and versus say a one Q of last year? Uh, if you could help uh, help us with that. And secondly, with respect to the retail protection, what is the kind of uh, uh, risk that you are taking on your own um, you know, balance sheet, and uh, what is the share, what is the level that you are passing out beyond which you are passing it on to the reinsurers? And any change there? Yeah, that would be my two questions. Hi, Prej. I think breaking it down back again into less than five lakhs and more than five lakhs. Uh, I think we'd want to stay away from that fundamentally because we still are looking at the opportunity. Uh, and like we said, there is going to be some shift that happens uh, across. It is not a large uh, amount that used to be for us, nor is it at this point. Uh, I think our focus overall is to be able to reach out to different consumer segments and uh, offer products that are relevant there. Uh, so if at some level the uh, more than five lakh ticket size, we are seeing some. Uh, if you see some drop coming from a non-pass segment, there are other products that we are uh, offering, and we are starting to see some pick up on that, which is what we mentioned earlier on the call. I, I think our focus will still be to be able to grow overall business, uh, irrespective of which segment it comes in from. Uh, coming to your second question on uh, retail protection. Uh, I, I, we have not changed our reinsurance levels on retail protection. Uh, the retention levels continue to be at uh, one crore, uh, and uh, we're comfortable with the experience uh, that we've taken on. Thanks. Thank you. We have our next question from the line of Nidesh Jain from Investec. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for the opportunity again. Uh, so in FI19, we put out an expiration to double GNB over uh, four years. Uh, Three to four years. Uh, 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 what are our aspirations for BNB and AP over medium to long term uh, in terms of growth? So, no, we'll just continue to work hard to ensure that BNB keeps increasing and with a slant towards growth. Okay, sure. Mr. Jain, does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Anup Bakshi for closing yeah. comments. Over to you, sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you all very much for joining uh, this evening. And uh, we'll just continue to work hard to ensure that all our customer needs are met uh, through the suitable products, through the most appropriate channels. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of ICICI Prudential Life Insurance Company, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.